So next up is my homegirl Sarah May. Uh, she lives up in San Francisco. She's a pivot at Pivotal Labs. She's uh, uh, friends and uh, cohorts with the diaspora. 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 And that's real close. Uh, the, the diasporas. And uh, we met a couple uh, year ago or so at uh, Gogoruko. And um, been buddies ever since. We've had some real heart to hearts, and uh, she w she was an obvious go to when it came to finding great speakers for this conference. So Sarah May. I'm going kind of low tech with my notes. Um, I'm I have to tell you I'm super nervous. I've never given a talk without slides. <laughs> I've always had slides that at least reminded me of what I was supposed to talk about next. I don't do bullet points, but at least then I don't forget entire sections. So my worst nightmare for this talk is I go 10 minutes and forget half the stuff I was going to say. So hopefully now that I've said that out loud, <laughs> I've dispelled the curse. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Um, so my name is Sarah, and I'm a computer programmer. And people have told me I don't look a whole lot like a computer programmer. Um, actually, lately at work, I've been trying to wear more skirts so I can change the visual idea of what a programmer is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so far, you know, no one else has taken me up on it at Pivotal, sadly enough. Although one guy said he would wear a kilt, uh, but he hasn't actually shown up in it yet, so we'll see. Um, and uh, I'm a programmer because I like to build stuff. What I like about programming is that I can build things with it, and I can have an idea, and I can build an entire system out of it um, by myself, which is kind of awesome, right? Like, I can build stuff where there wasn't anything before. And I like programming itself. I like the mechanics of programming well enough. Um, or I wouldn't be doing this, right? But what I really love about it, what gets me up in the morning, is the ability to build stuff. Um, and uh, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell you two secrets about programming. Um, and I'm, if you're a programmer, I'm probably going to insult you. So just be prepared. Um, so since this is kind of a different crowd than we had this morning, I want to take a little bit of temperature. Raise your hand if you're a developer. I guess if part of your day-to-day -day job, you write code. OK. so. How many people have tried programming and then spent like five hours tracking down something that turned out to be a comma missing somewhere and you were like, fuck this, I'm going back to something I like better. <laughs> OK, so some of the same people raised their hands, which is an interesting uh, combination. And uh, how many people have never tried programming ever? Not even looked at code. Wow, that's awesome. So <laughs> the last category, right, is the one that's actually the most numerous in the world at large, even though I forget that. I live in San Francisco in my little tech bubble, and all the people I know are programmers. But you know, even in the city of San Francisco, most of the people there have never tried programming. And sometimes I wonder about why that is, right? Like, there's a lot of people that just, it never even occurred to them. Even if they're smart, even if they're like reasonably tech savvy, it never occurred to them to try programming. And you know, I started wondering a couple years ago why that was. I mean, when I was when I was in high school, you know, if you're good at communicating, I, I was pretty good at writing. I was good at like English. Um, you know, I didn't get pointed towards programming as a potential career, even though I was like, I want to build stuff. They were like, Well, how about English literature? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not sure that we're on the same page here. <laughs> And you know, people who are good at math, I was also reasonably good at math. But what I noticed was that like people who are good at math sometimes got pointed to programming. Um, but if they were also if they were good at math, but they were also good at communicating, they never got pointed to programming. Right? If you were if it was one of these people that was like, well, I want to work with people, which is one of the, I don't understand that at all. Um, if you were one of those people that was like one of those people, you never got pointed to programming. You know why? And that's different than other engineering, other pieces of engineering, right? Even other other sciences. Like, there's this stereotype of programmers as being kind of antisocial and just unable to communicate. And, you know, people think about programmers and they think about them as people who spend all day in front of their computer with their headphones on, like in a room with as few windows as possible, like basement preferred, right? But they'll take like a cube in the middle of the building if they can't get the basement. Um, and, you know, people who work with programmers are like, okay, over there is where we keep our developers. Don't go talk to them or they'll growl at you. <laughs> and God forbid you ask them to go to a meeting. Right? Like it's, this is the stereotype. That we're, and there's a certain amount of truth to that stereotype, right? But, you know, uh, I 
I think that one of the big secrets about programming, and one of the reasons that we get some like an, an interesting and, and unusual mix of people into programming, uh, one of the secrets about it, though, is that it really doesn't have anything to do with math. And people that are good at programming tend to be people who are good translators. And I have a slightly different definition of good programmer, maybe, than most people do, which is that, to me, someone who's a good programmer builds stuff that's actually useful, builds stuff that people use. And the difference there, I think a lot of people when they think good programmer, there's like good code style, right? The difference between like YouTube comments and the New York Times editorial page, right? <laughs> and then there's like, then there's content, right? Once in a while, YouTube comments have something more interesting to say than the New York Times editorial page, right? And to me, what makes code really useful is the fact that it can do something useful for someone else, right? But people are going to use it. And people who tend to be good programmers, how many people have ever done any kind of like translation work from like one language to another, human language? It's actually really, really difficult. Like, it's one of those things where you take a piece of text in the original and you look at the, the words that the original author chose, and they chose words that convey some kind of surface meaning, but they also chose words that convey certain emotions. So when you translate, you need to pick words that convey both the meaning and the emotion of the original text, which is actually pretty difficult to do because sometimes there aren't words that have the same combination of meaning and feeling in the, in the, in the destination language as they were in the source language. So translation, programming is fundamentally a translation task where you're taking your vision of what you want something to do, what you want the computer to do, and you are translating it so that you and the computer are on the same page, right? So that you and the computer have a shared vision of what's going to happen, right? Um, so people who are good at translations tend to be good programmers. And I think that's one of the reasons that, that uh, women are underrepresented, because people who are good translators and good at communication tend not to be pushed towards programming. Um, so the second secret of programming, I think, is that people who work like in the basement by themselves with their headphones on all day actually kind of write pretty shitty code. <laughs> and by that I mean they write the wrong code, right? They write the things that no one wants to use. They write the things that aren't actually useful. Um, and it took me a really, really long time to figure that out because the, the myth, there's this myth of the program that's super strong, right? Not only in the media at large, but among programmers. And there's a certain resistance to the idea of like something different, some other way of, of programming. Um, my first job out of college, this is going to be kind of funny given the other talks we've had today. My first job out of college, I worked at Microsoft. Uh, and I moved <laughs> up to Seattle, right? And uh, I went to work in a project. And, and so at the time, Microsoft was kind of like Google is now. Like it was sort of vaguely past its prime, but there was still a lot of really interesting things to do there. Um, and, and so I went up and I, I showed up and they gave me an office, like an off, like a real office with a door. And everybody got an office at Microsoft at that time, your own office. And um, the modus operandi basically was you show up in the morning, go into your office, close the door, work all day, go home. Without, like, you know, maybe like you'd go out and you'd go to the bathroom and you see someone in the hallway and you'd be like, hi. And that was about sort of the sum total of the social interaction you generally did. And I was on a project, I was on a project that was like exciting by Microsoft standards. Right? It was a greenfield project, no existing code base, no existing users. Um, and one of the first things that happened when I showed up, the, the project had only been going a couple of weeks, and one of the first things that happened was that they, we got an email, we all got this email that had a document attached that was this beautiful document about our users and what they were going to do with the product and how it would make them feel and what they wanted to use it for. Um, it, was, it was interesting. But the problem with a document like that, right, is that you can't really ask it questions. So, and we had no access to the people who had been hopefully, in theory, interviewed to make that document. And so we just had people whose job it was to guess what they wanted based on this document. And so as developers, as the people who were actually building the product, we had no access to like actual potential users. And so we were just writing, we were making shit up, right? We're like, oh, we think they wanted, we'd have meetings where we would discuss whether the, uh, the, the kind of fake person that they had, the persona they had created in this document wanted to do this from the menu or wanted to do it from a right click. Like we had meetings, so we just, and then someone would win and we'd write it and keep that. But it was like, we just kind of made shit up, right? And it was, um, it felt kind of futile, right? And um, around about that time, there was a, has anyone here ever heard of a singer called Utah Phillips? 
kind of a folk singer. He's a Christian anarchist, which is an interesting combination. Um, he died a few years ago, but he, he, had, he put out an album right about that time. It was basically him like telling stories on top of music by Ani DeFranco. And uh, <laughs> it's bizarre. It's, it's awesome. It's like Joe bizarre. Yeah. But one of the things that he said on that album um, was that, um, and I'm going to read it because I thought it was so awesome. What he said was, I learned when I was young that the only true life I have is the life in my brain. But if it's, if it's true that the only real life I have is the life of my brain, what sense does it make to hand that brain to someone for eight hours a day for their particular use on the presumption that when they, take, when they give it back at the end of the day, it will be in an unmutilated condition? <laughs> <laughs> and I listened to that when I was in my office with my door closed. <laughs> thought, what am I doing here? Because every day I came to work, and you know, I, I was 22, I didn't really know what having a real job was supposed to feel like. You know, and I just kind of thought, well, this must be how it is, right? And every day I came to work, and I just felt more like this is a waste of my time. This is a waste of my energy. Um, and I fantasized about like going and being an aerobics instructor at Club Med. It was something <laughs> totally different. Um, which I know, can you just picture me doing that? That would be hilarious. Um, and uh, one day I called up my friend in, in San Francisco. I said, hey, can I, um, can I crash on your couch for a couple weeks? And he was like, sure, what are you doing down here? I was like, I don't know. I gotta get out of here. <laughs> it was the middle of winter in Seattle, too, which is like, it was a particularly bad time. I'd go to work at 8.30 and I'd leave work at 6 and it would be dark on both sides. Right? There was no, it was just, uh, and I'd moved up there from San Diego, so it was, uh, it was not a good transition. <laughs> So, so I came down to San Francisco and I started talking to my friend and he was at the startup, so I took a job at the startup and uh, all of a sudden I was like, oh, huh, they don't have offices here. I'm not going to get my own office, am I? They had us all in a big bullpen, right? We were expected to talk to each other, like, during the day. It's like, oh, this is kind of cool. <laughs> this is kind of neat. Um, and they actually brought in users, like, actual users of the site that we were going to build. You know, so. But the interesting thing about it, I mean, everyone knows that you need to be able to, you know, in order to build a good product, you have to talk to users. But one, of the, one of the things I realized when I was going through this is that talking to users and talking to other people made me a better programmer. Like, it made my code better. And I started thinking, huh, something to like this communications thing. So I was a nerdy kid, right? Like, I, I don't know, I like to read a lot. This is before the internet was widely available, right, when I was a kid. And so I read, I spent tons of time in the library, and, uh, you know, I, I read every book in every section of my school library when I was in middle school. Um, and uh, so I started thinking, huh, I need to do more communication. How do I do that? I wasn't very good at it. Um, I'm still not very good at it. Um, how many people have heard of, like, the Myers-Briggs personality tests? So that basically it's like one of these things where it's a big matrix of different types of personalities. And what the first letter is four letters. The first letter is either an I or an E. Either an introvert or an extrovert. Right? So an introvert, this is a review for most of you, I think. An introvert is someone who has, uh, who, um, for whom talking to people is a, a draining activity. Right? You can do it. It's fine. But it doesn't energize you. An extrovert, on the other hand, is someone you talk, who talks to people and gets energy out of doing that. Um, and I was definitely firmly on the I side for a long time. I just had trouble, like, I would rather, it was like, I would rather clean the bathroom than go to a party kind of deal, right? Like, I just had trouble talking to people. Um, but I discovered that, like, the more I did it, A, the better I got at it, but B, the better actually it made my code. Because not only was I writing better code, but I was writing code that was actually more in line with what people actually wanted to do with it. Um, and Sometimes I felt like I got more out of three days at a conference. Like I got better programming out of three days of a conference than I did out of three days of actual programming. And you know, I started teaching classes, which was a really interesting experience. I at that point I had been programming, you know, for a while. And I, I you know, I learned about arrays a long time ago. But if you have to actually explain to somebody what a variable is, or what an array is, it was really an interesting experience. I, I ended up with a lot more it definitely added nuance to, to things that I thought I already understood. Um, and just explaining it to someone. 
And uh, then uh, a couple of years ago when I started working at Pivotal, of course we do pair programming all the time, which uh, is sort of the like, the woo crazy part of XP that no one actually does, right? This is the part where you've got one computer, hopefully with a big monitor, right? And you've got two keyboards, and you've got two mice, two chairs, and two people sitting there looking at the same computer, right? Working on the same code at the same time. And, you know, I've been doing this for a while. And I was already a pretty good programmer, I thought, when I joined Pivotal. I mean, I may have been wrong, <laughs> but I thought so. Um, but, you know, all the time when I did doing all this teaching and I had been going to a lot of conferences, when it came down to program, it was still just me and the computer. Right? It was still just me and the computer, hopefully, you know, at least four or five hours a day, if I was lucky, between meetings and whatever else. Um, programming. And then when I started working at Pivotal, it was like, suddenly, I spent eight hours a day talking to people about programming. And it was bizarre. It was exhausting. Like, I would go home at the end of the day and just be like, nobody talks to me, I'm going to bed. And, it, but one of the interesting things that happened was that I, I got really quickly better at communicating, even with people that weren't programmers. Just talking about what I did all the time seemed to like, turn me into someone that could talk to other people about what they did, even if it wasn't programming, which was like, hey. And I also started noticing that if I went a few hours without talking to somebody, I started feeling antsy, which was a totally new experience for me. Definitely, definitely very strange. Um, and, you know, I, one of the things that I've noticed, though, is that, is that in the last year and a half, I've gone from being a decent programmer to being like a really, really good one. And that's an interesting feeling, because I had already thought I was decent, right? So what else could I do? Right? What, what other unseen leveling up opportunities are out there? <laughs> um, I'm letting you in on one. <laughs> but if you have others, I want to hear about it. Um, so I don't think I took 10 minutes, but I took a pretty short amount of time. So I want to leave you with a thought, um, which goes along with a lot of the other stuff people have talked about today. Um, I want you to remember the, the Utah Phillips quote and think about who it is that you're handing your brain to for eight hours a day. And is it worth it? Is it worth it? people that you're giving it to, is it worth it to, when you're giving it back? Um, and I encourage you to try and find a job or a profession or something where not only do you get your brain back unmutilated, but hopefully transformed and improved, <laughs> it magic sprinkly dust on it. Um, and, you know, we're all in a fairly privileged position, right? And we, most of us have that choice to make. And I think that we should all make it. Thank you. This may be hard to answer. Without getting too geeky, in what ways would you say that you are a better programmer? Like, is there any sort of generic description that just makes sense to people who may not necessarily be developers? So, so when I'm when I'm programming by myself, it's basically a, a variation on fail faster, right? So, so the the time between when I make a stupid mistake in the code and the time when I find out about it is shorter if I'm sitting there with somebody else and they can point it out, right? Like, oh, there's the typo. I mean, at the very sort of trivial level, they can point out typos before I even have to run the specs, right? Or they can point out, oh, you know what? This doesn't belong in this object. I think it should be over here in this other file because blah, 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 blah. And then we have a discussion about why it should not be over there because it should definitely be over here. <laughs> and then, you know, and then we, you know, we negotiate and we discuss why it should be over there, over here. And it, so basically, it's, it's, it's some variation of, of fail faster, right? You find out about your mistakes sooner, and so you can iterate faster. Do you have any tips on how to teach people programming? Like, um, I'm, I'm starting to do it myself, and I've always taught myself, and uh, like, it's already exposing the gaps in my own knowledge, and I thought I knew everything, or, <laughs> or you know, enough, but, uh, but yeah, can you talk a little bit more about that? I think, you know, I, the first time that I taught that I tried to explain to somebody what a variable does, I think I did a really, really horrible job. I was like, a variable, it's a thing in memory, 
<laughs> it's a place in memory where you want to keep something. And they just looked at me with this blank look, like, what are you talking about? And I, I honestly think that the only way to do it is just to explain it more than once, like to explain it over and over again to people, to different people. Like, I explain it, I try it, so for a while I got in this thing where I was like, you know, I'd explain it to taxi drivers, you know, or something. You know, like anyone that I happened to run into that, like, I could make them listen to me for more than, like, 30 seconds, I'd be like, hey, have you ever tried programming? <laughs> Let me tell you about it. I was one of those super obnoxious people. I kind of got away from that, thankfully. But, uh, yeah, I think just, just doing it. You had a question. On the subject of language, how do you feel about, oh, sorry. So on the subject of language and programming, how do you feel about linguistic kinds of programming, text programming versus visual programming? Do you think visual programming is a good thing for teaching, a bad, no effect? What do you think? I think it depends on what you're trying to teach. I think for concepts, sometimes visual programming can be super useful. And there are people who learn in different ways too, right? So there are some people for whom like a visual representation of something is much more powerful than a textual representation. And so I think it's good sometimes to have both if you can. You know, I try to have, I mean, this is not quite the same thing, but you know, in, in the classes I teach, I try to have both diagrams that show what I'm talking about and code examples that show what I'm talking about because a lot of times, you know, some people will, you know, have a lot more success with one than the other. So, yeah. I want to comment. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say, uh, like, explaining a, uh, I've done this a little myself, explaining a linked list in text and a linked list in a diagram, uh, pretty much everybody gets it if you explain it in a diagram the first time. If you try to explain it in text, it'd probably take you an hour to try and explain to it, uh, because it's sort of like the difference between, like, math being, uh, between apples and math being the derivative of something, right? If it's apples, it's something that you can latch onto, that you, they can see, and so, yeah. That, that. I find that there are some people, though, that, that like, maybe they should have been programmers originally because they really get the text versions yeah. okay. of things. I mean, it just depends on the person, but, yeah, I think it's good to have both. But even when, but I, I feel as though, I don't know, I don't have a huge explaining programming experience, but I do like teaching. Um, I feel as though connecting with what they already know is the key. It doesn't matter. That's true. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> it helps to have, if you can, you know, most of the time when I do these classes, I try and break the classes up by sort of similar experience. So I'll put all the people together who are like front-end web designers, and I'll put in all the people together who are like project managers. And that makes it much easier because then you can start, you know, connecting to what they know. Yeah? Thank Yours? you.